alumni panel. I am Elizabeth Williams. I'm a faculty member in the department and the director of undergraduate studies. And I am so excited to introduce you to our three alums who are here today. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to give them about five, seven, however long they want to tell their story. Um, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So, um, they changed the room on us overnight, and I'm not quite sure why, but just make sure that you have yourself seated so you can engage with these alum. Um, so our first alum on the end is Dan Clemens. He graduated um, from CSU in 1990, um, and he is an expert in workplace communication, change, and culture, and that's where his work has, has been. Um, and then we have Annika Gill, who graduated with her BA in 02, and then stayed here for her MA, um, which she received in 04 from the department. And she um, works with um, industry research, project management, grant development, and the implementation <coughs> of continuing medical education. So she's in the healthcare field. And then we have Bailey Greger on the end here. She is our most recent alum, 2014. Um, and she is a Senior Human Resources Specialist for Beaver Creek Resort. So she's up in the mountains working in the hospitality industry. So um, I am going to let you all get started on telling your stories, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thanks for being here this morning. I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> okay, so I graduated in December of 2014, um, and now I'm at Beaver Creek Resort, uh, an HR specialist. So I kind of just want to talk about um, my journey from when I graduated until now. It was definitely a little bit of a challenge kind of finding, you know, the right job for me um, and then kind of feeling a bit accomplished after graduation. It's hard just to get out and then, you know, find something right away. So uh, how I actually first got connected with Phil Resorts is I went to a job fair here um, and they had a booth for Bell Resorts and I talked to somebody. I know that I wanted to go into HR, um, so I kind of had talked to him if they had any jobs open, uh, and they did have one, um, but it was kind of starting to close down. They already had a great, some great candidates. Uh, so I applied for the job, uh, didn't get it that time because I needed somebody in October, and I wasn't graduating until December. So I knew that I wanted to move up to the mountains, uh, and I had applied to a bunch of different jobs within the company. It's a wide range. There's retail, uh, hospitality, food and beverage. So I interviewed for several positions, mostly with hotels. Uh, and I finally got a seasonal position um, with their product sales team in Vail. So working in one of the ticket offices selling tickets. Uh, and that was a huge transition and it was a little bit hard. It was hard to go from <coughs> classes and learning a bunch to a pretty entry level position um, that was pretty basic. And it was also seasonal. So I you know, worked the season, but it was going to end in April when the mound closed. So I was on the job search again pretty recently uh, after getting that position. I interviewed with Vail HR again um, twice and didn't, didn't make it. Um, I then interviewed with the Marriott HR, which is still with Vail Resorts. They kind of, it's a partner company. And I did not get it again, so that was that was really hard. It was really stressful to know that, you know, my job was ending and I needed to find something soon. Um, so actually, through a connection, one of my managers um, in the ticket office knew someone at the HR in Beaver Creek, which is pretty close to Vail. So I, you know, kind of got that connection that way. Uh, I interviewed with them, uh, and it was pretty hard. That was maybe, you know, my tenth. 10th interview for an HR position, uh, the next day they called me and offered me a job. So it was a lot of, of trying and not giving up and not, you know, getting so down on, you know, I've interviewed so many times for this position and I still haven't gotten it. Um, so that was, that was really exciting. It was still an entry level position. So um, the past two years I worked as an HR specialist for the front desk um, for the resort. So we have 3,500 employees in the wintertime. Uh, we ramp up in the wintertime um, for, of course, skiing and have you know tons of, of different types of positions. Uh, then, uh, recently, I actually got promoted, so I'm the senior HR specialist now uh, and supervise the team uh, at the front desk, so that's really exciting. Um, and I really, really love my job, but it was 
hard to kind of get there um, and to feel accomplished after graduating and not too hard on myself after, you know, going into something so entry. Um, but yeah, so very excited now and happy to be where I'm at. Very good. Um, I'm Annika Gill. Um, and as Elizabeth mentioned, I did both my, my undergrad and graduate degrees here at CSU in the Comm Studies program. When I went, it was called speech communication, so I've trained my brain to, to Comm Studies. <coughs> but, uh, Good, I feel better. <laughs> I thought I was going to be the only one. <laughs> no. um, and so I'm in the um, continuing medical education industry or enterprise. Um, and when I, um, I started out as a pre-med major, and was, my major was biology, and my sophomore year switched over to speech comm because um, then the, um, the MCAT was showing that those who, who took that, that exam, um, those who scored the highest were actually liberal arts majors who then had taken all of the uh, prerequisites to go to med school. And so, um, so I made the switch and then I ended up not going to med school. Um, that was always kind of in the back of my head, but, but I knew I wanted to be in healthcare somehow. And actually, as I was um, going through school, I really hadn't ever heard of the continuing medical education industry. Um, and it was not a, a super direct um, pathway for me out of my master's program. I had a small stint selling AM radio, Paul Harvey, in particular radio, um, advertising slots um, out in Northeast Colorado that gave me a lot of um, experience just for, for you know, life, but I was excited to get out of that industry <laughs> pretty quickly. Um, and it actually was through networking um, with a former uh, alum from the, the, the Comm Studies program who graduated um, in the late 80s that I landed an internship in, in the CME space. And um, it was a marketing internship and that then turned into a, a full-time gig. Um, so since then, I've been in the, the industry and um, worked for both for-profit and not-for-profit medical education companies um, to develop continuing education for physicians primarily, um, who do some with, did some with nurses and pharmacists as well. Um, and then in 2008, I had the opportunity to start my own business with, um, with a, a, a partner. And so um, AOE Consulting is, is that business um, that I work for, and we are a consulting company in the continuing medical education space. We um, work with organizations, there's different types of, of uh, companies that can be accredited to do continuing education for physicians, um, hospitals, medical schools, uh, medical education companies, you have medical specialty societies like the American Heart Association or American Stroke Association. Um, and so I work with those types of companies now to help them maintain those accreditations um, so that they can continue, and offer, continue offering education for physicians. So lots of, of um, you know, work that I do daily draws upon um, the foundation that was really set with both my undergraduate and graduate degree. Um, I do a lot of training. I, I'm speaking on a daily basis. A lot, a lot of writing that um, that we do. If it's an audit report or just marketing for our own, our own company. Um, so, so anyhow, that's I'm, I'm in that space, and um, it's it's pretty exciting and. And like I said, every day there's there's something I'm drawing upon from either Dr. AFD's co-cultural class or T having taught SP 200 or Dr. Burkhardt's advanced public speaking class. So um, it just has been an invaluable set of tools that I gather here on campus and then utilize on a daily basis um, in my professional life. Yeah, so I'm um, Dan Clemens, and I uh, I came up to CSU on a baseball scholarship, and that's and I wanted to get into uh, sports broadcasting, so I chose the communications department and um, <clears throat> that was great until I tore up my shoulder and I uh, had three surgeries and I kind of ended my, my baseball career and I had to figure out okay well what else is there in life and um, stumbled around for a little while um, I, I, that kind of preludes the one of the messages that uh, I hope you kind of take away from from our panel here is is that you're probably going to have to reinvent yourself several times in your career, and probably as soon as you graduate, you're going to have to reinvent yourself and reinvent yourself a, a, a few years from now as well. Um, I stayed in speech communication. I really enjoyed the, the rhetoric side of things, um, and, and the major really worked for me. I really enjoyed communication, the, pub, the public speaking portion of it. Um, and then when I graduated, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, and I kind of floundered around for a little while, and I ended up taking a, a sales position. And I was sell it, selling uh, advertising space in some trade publications. And I didn't really see myself 
as a salesperson, that really wasn't where my, my passion was at. I didn't really know what my passion was, um, but I did that for a while, and I did that for a couple of years, and it was really good experience. Um, not because I wanted a career in sales, but it taught me what the sales role is like, and so any organization you're going to go into, it's likely going to have some sort of sales component, whether you do it your, a lot of it yourself as a, as a kind of an independent consultant or uh, a large organization. So that was really good experience. Um, it was also in a, in a technical field. It was in satellite communications, and so I learned a lot about that industry. And the people that I was, I was selling advertising space to were in operations, and they were in marketing in their organization. So I kind of got to know a little bit about what made them tick. So after a couple of years, I started to get a sense of, okay, this is, this is what these different industries are like, and this is what these different jobs within a company are like. And then I, I jumped ship and got into um, corporate communications, public relations, and that was really a good fit for me. And had, had a really good job. I was with uh, First Data Corporation, which owned Western Union. Uh, they just bought Western Union, so kind of came in at the tail end of a merger and got to see culturally what that was like. And that was my first introduction into, wow, there are different cultures in, in an organization and they don't like one another. And so what do we do about that? And so trying to help the organization communicate a little bit more effectively. Um, I also had the opportunity there to do both internal communication, which I talk about as kind of workplace communication, helping the, the organization communicate within itself a little bit more effectively. And I also got to do some media relations. Um, the highlight of that, I think I got to fly to Oklahoma City on some late night flight. They laid off 160 people the next day, yeah. and I got to be in front of the camera and, and, and do that, which it sounds glamorous, but it really sucks. Um, and um, so realized that I really didn't like the external side of things, like the internal uh, side of things. So had um, <clears throat> a couple, I worked in healthcare for a short period of time. Uh, that was a situation where I, I joined a hospital company and did the communications for them. They, um, two weeks after I started, the CEO resigned, and then two weeks after that, uh, they were being investigated by the FBI for Medicare billing fraud. And I think it was like on my 35th day or something like that, I had to fill out an affidavit, affidavit with the <coughs> FBI saying what I had actually communicated in the employee newsletter. And um, so at that point, I kind of decided, all right, maybe I need to reinvent myself again. <laughs> <coughs> so I um, had a five-month stint uh, with working for the hospital and uh, worked for US West, which became Quest, which became CenturyLink. And uh, my last job there was I was in charge of merger communication for the merger with Quest. And so did a lot of writing, kind of some strategy. Um, it was really a mess culturally. They were just completely different organizations with different ideas and really didn't like one another. Um, and so at the end of that merger, as it, as it uh, went down, I had the option of staying or leaving, and I said, please get me out of here. And I'd had some friends that were uh, freelance writers, and I thought, you know, that's what I want to do. So I jumped in and I started freelance writing. And I did that for a few months, and that was fun. But I kind of got bored with that. And so I got more into communications consulting. I facilitated teams. I did a, some, uh, some training. And then I got really into the idea of culture and change in organizations. And that's what I've been doing for really the last seven or eight years, almost exclusively, is helping organizations understand cultural differences. Uh, Bailey will talk a little bit about the merger that went through, that they, they are, are about to go through, or I guess it's more of an acquisition than a merger. But you know, when two organizations come together, they have very different ways of thinking of themselves, how they make decisions, how they do rewards and recognition, how they do budgeting, finance, all those internal things. And if you don't think about how culturally that's going to work, it can be a real mess. And so that's what I really enjoy, is kind of bridging that gap between organizational development and communications. And as I look back over my, I won't say how many years, of um, experience, Having done a lot of different things, even though I knew that wasn't what I wanted my career to be, but having gotten that experience allowed me to be in a position at a relatively young age to be able to go off on my own and make a living um, consulting, which is a lifestyle that I really enjoy. Um, 
So I think I went over seven minutes. You but. <laughs> All right, so we would love to open it up to questions now. I'm sure they've given you a lot of good information, a lot of jumping off points. So ask the questions that you have. Yeah. Uh, I really like this concept of like reinventing yourself because like I, I'm about to graduate in May and I like feel that I'm struggling like trying to figure out what I want to do because I feel like communication you can go on so many different paths as each of you have been able to do but um, do either of you guys feel that that's kind of like something that you had to do as well like this whole idea of reinventing yourself or is that yeah, um, so I, I kind of always knew, well, at least my senior year, that I wanted to try and go into HR and see if I liked it. But kind of like I, kind of like I talked about, um, you know, I didn't wasn't able to right away go into that, and I had to start with something that, you know, I wasn't passionate about, and it wasn't something that I really wanted to do. So I think kind of that that switch over um, when I actually did get the job I wanted, it was just a whole different perspective change. Um, and I just really had to be okay with where I was at at that time. Um, so I think that that was, for me, that was kind of a reinventing of myself. It wasn't necessarily about what I wanted to do, but just kind of accepting where I was at. Um, and, you know, ultimately, that was kind of what got me to where I wanted to be, too. So. For sure. Um, I think that um, the same skill set that goes into reinventing yourself is um, very likely what will serve you even if you stay in a particular career because things aren't stagnant and so um, being able to to be nimble be flexible be proactively thinking about um, you know kind of depending on whatever industry it is you know what is the the you know where are things going for for my industry or my my organization um, you know where do I see my skill set fitting how can I help to lead if you're wanting to, to grow in a company um, you know, are, are some of the same skills that you draw upon if you're really looking to, to jump ship and, and go in an entirely different direction. And I think as quickly as, as things are moving in, in this day and age, that um, that's that's invaluable to be able to do. I think that's that's a really good point. I, I think you'll have to, I, I realized oh, a few months ago that I had kind of stagnated a little bit. Um, one of the one of the partner consulting firms I um, work with um, at a small merger that uh, actually was an acquisition that they wanted some communication support for. So I was kind of partnered with the HR person in the acquiring company to help out with communications. She had never done communications and was kind of overwhelmed by this idea of having to drive communications for a big acquisition like that. And so I was playing kind of a mentor role as well as helping out with, with a lot of the, the stuff that needed to be done. And she kept firing off these, what at first were kind of irritating questions of, well, you know, what, what publications, you know, do you find most helpful? Or what communications books should I read that are, you know, that are current and, and uh, you know, most helpful? And I was, oh, gosh, I think the last communication book I read was, well, I don't, I don't know when it was. But, um, and, I, and I realized very quickly that I, I have stagnated. And, and it's not that I'm necessarily going to, to your point, reinvent the career that I'm in. But I... But I probably ought to be current on a, a few things. Um, if if even even if I didn't have that, I realized that yeah, I, I need to do that. So hopefully your learning doesn't end here in just a couple of months. I have a question. Since uh, you're here on the panel, I, is it right to assume then that you've somehow maintained a connection with CSU? And if so, how have you done that? And what? value is there in doing that? Um, I'll start. So I think we were actually talking about this before we started. It's the relationships <clears throat> that you build when you're here. So I had several classes with Elizabeth and we've kept in touch and for me that's kind of what brought me back. Um, so I think building those relationships while you're here and then even after you leave, utilizing and, and, and keeping in touch for me that is how I still feel kind of a part of the, the CSU community and why I'm here. Um, in addition, I'll put a plug in for the Alumni <laughs> Association. Um, so I, I developed a number of, of really great um, connections and friendships, both through my undergrad and my graduate time here at CSU. And um, I'm actually um, fortunate to be employing one of my, my graduate school colleagues. Um, and, and so that's definitely one way. But I've also gotten involved with the, um, through 
know, BSB being an, alum, an alumnus. And um, it's not as active at this moment as it used to be, but I lived down in Denver, and um, there was a, a pretty active at one time um, downtown Denver network um, group of alums, and, and so we would, there was different committees that I was part of the Arts and Education Committee, and, and do, we would do fundraising and whatnot for, for CSU. Um, and so there's, um, and there's frequently events, like the, the campus has been really great about bringing things down to, to Denver, but I know that um, you know, they go nationwide, and so I think that that's another way to, to stay connected um, as well. And then, of course, um, anytime I get an opportunity to come back and do things like this, um, I enjoy coming back to campus, so um, you know, try to stay connected in that manner as well. Yeah, and I, um, actually Elizabeth and I bumped into one another, met each other through a mutual friend uh, last fall. Mm -hmm and um, wanted to get reconnected. Uh, I think Dr. Burkhart is the, is the last uh, professor that I had that, that, that uh, was, was here when I, when, I, uh, when I went. So I would say it's a two-way street, um, you know, that it's not, it's not only the department's responsibility to reach out to uh, graduates, but I do feel, I do feel better being, being connected. I mean, there, there's, there's a little bit of nostalgia uh, with that, but, um, it's it's fun to be in a in a room full of um, folks who understand what I went through X number of years ago, and if there's a way that I can help and give back, I know that there were people that did that, um, you know, for me back then. So it's it's fun, and and I'll it, my son goes here now, so uh. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, when I was looking to, to to leave campus and was was finishing my my graduate degree, um, I knowing that I, I was was looking for a job, needed a job, all of that, I, I did as much networking as I could, trying to um, connect with former graduates of not only the program, but just of, of CSU in, in general. And, um, you know, there was a lot, I knew I wanted to be in healthcare, but I didn't know if it was, you know, like healthcare policy, if it was lobbyist work, if it was, um, just what was it? And so I, I would encourage you to, and I, I and the damage in this, and, and I love helping out too. If um, folks have questions about, you know, how it is you go about um, the job search and, and um, you know, kind of figuring out how to market this really vast array of skills that you do have, but it's not like engineering where it's this very specific technical skill you've got. Um, I, I love staying connected and, and trying to help students because I was once there. Thank you. Yeah. So this is specifically for Annika, but. I've been looking at applying for a hospital position with Scott and White in Texas. Um, and I, if I were to get an interview and if I were to go into that field, what are some of like the not glamorous parts to like be prepared for? Because I, I don't know, I'm afraid of not being successful in it because it is such a huge hospital. Sure. Is it like the, the, the communications department or where, mm -hmm. is that what you're yeah. looking at doing? Um, it was an undergraduate. I actually worked at Peter Valley Hospital, um, our health systems, uh, and now is it um, it's CU? Is that what it goes by? PH? UC Health. UC Health. UC Health. Anyhow, I um, wasn't in the communications program, but I worked in their call center, um, and so I have a little bit of experience. I work with hospitals now, but I, you know, on the outside as a consultant, but I, I have a little bit of experience working within the healthcare system. I think that um, one of the um, and, and you might know better about the communication side of it, but hospitals are a 24-7 sort of system. And so um, a position like communications might be more of a, a Monday through Friday sort of role, but things are still happening at the hospital. And I would imagine in a, in a communications field, you know, you've got to be on your toes, much like anybody who's communicating out for an organization, because um, things are happening on the weekends and after hours and, and all sorts of things. I think that, um, you know, with there's there's a lot of change with in the healthcare system now, and in terms of being successful or wanting to be successful, um, your learning definitely isn't going to stop. It really isn't for anybody, but it isn't going to stop in the next few months when you graduate. Um, there's a lot going on right now with you know what is happening with the Affordable Care Act and, and things, and that's a the communications department in any healthcare system is is going to be pretty um, challenged and, and charged with with disseminating you know messages to all sorts of stakeholders, um, but. You know, as far as not glamorous parts, I mean, any job's going to have things that you um, like doing less than other things. Um, but part of it, too, is just, 
you're, you know, when you're first in that career level position, you're just trying to amass experience. And so, um, you know, I think going into anything with an open mind and trying to take from it what you can is probably some of the best advice that I would have. Yeah, I'd, I'd add on to that. I've got to, um, well, I, I think the, the more networking that you can do in that position, uh, the more effective communicator you'll be. You know, the communications function is, um, I always find it kind of strange that we're usually the last to know in an organization of what, what's going on, but we're on the hook to communicate to everybody else what, what is going on. And so the more people that you can know and have a good relationship with in all the different departments, so you know somebody in radiology, and if so if something happens, you've got a patient's event that happens in radiology or in the ER or whatever, You've got a good, great relationship. You pick up the phone, and you, or you can walk down there, and that person will give you the straight scoop rather than you having to try to introduce yourself um, and say, "Here's what I'm here to do." And wait, are you are you with the media? Like, what are you trying to do? Um, so um, th there will be unglamorous parts of that job as well. Uh, one of my clients, um, former clients, uh, was a communications director at a hospital, and um, one, there were times where they would be so behind on the laundry, she would go down and she would actually fold towels uh, or fold sheets uh, because they needed that. They had they had beds that were you know they need, they needed to put patients in beds and they didn't have linen, so she would go down and do that. So, but the relationship she made while doing that, sitting next to whomever was folding sheets as well, that served her well. So. You know, she she didn't necessarily enjoy doing it, but she did with a smile on her face, and that made huge dividends. I definitely agree. Um, we, where I work at Beaver Creek, we have so many different business partners: retail, hospitality, food and dining, you know, grooming, you know, skier services. Building those relationships and getting to know somebody in all those departments makes my job so much easier. Knowing who to reach out to, who has the best information, is huge. So those relationships that you build will help so much. This is kind of re related, but I was in Houston on, on uh, Monday night, and my uh, business partner and I were facilitating a workshop all, on Tuesday, and so we had to make copies. And so for half an hour, we stood around the copier waiting for it to make 22 copies of a 30-page PowerPoint presentation, just staring over it. And he made the comment of, yeah, this is a glamorous side of being a consultant, isn't it? You know? And so uh, wherever you're at, they'll be good and bad. Yeah. Oh, this is a mask, okay. oh yeah. Yeah. So with everything with everything being so digital and like the new day, how is that impacting communications as well as like job search and networking? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Start with, um, how is how is like uh, like the new digital era impacted communications? Or have you noticed an impact at all? Or is it? Is well, it I think that the I mean, social media these days yeah. is um, is just has has flourished. And so um, when I started in in my career and and even in continuing medical education, um, that was first off, didn't exist initially, and then was just getting started and, and things like that. And so, um, <coughs> basically, you, we've had to embrace it. I mean, you know, you have to embrace it, and then, um, and I've hired people who are younger than I am, who are um, a bit savvier with social media, but um, you embrace it, and, and I think that the companies that are successful, um, you know, you, you learn how to utilize it effectively. Um, but I think that um, with, with social media and, and, and things like that, too, um, and this is where your ability to be an effective communicator comes in and you're drawing upon your skills that you learned here in, um, in, in undergraduate. Um, you've, got to, you've got to figure out how to be effective with your communication and you have to know who your target audience is. So part of that is understanding you know, how much word space or, or communication time you have to work with um, and then making the most of that. Um, so I think that as things have gone digital, um, you're having to make points much quicker and much more succinct and, and concise because people aren't going to spend time weeding through details um, maybe like they once did. I think, I think there's also, there, there's kind of two ends uh, of the spectrum as well. I think there is there's one end that 
is becoming much more digital and, and reliant upon all sorts of different apps to communicate in the workplace, um, intranet, you know, there's, there's a whole form, there's a lot of electronic media out there to do that. I've got a, I've got a number of clients though that are, where part of their workforce is, wants to go further and further in that direction, but part of their workforce, um, they don't do email. Like I'm working with a utility right now, and so these are guys that they climb up the pole to make sure that the electrical power works. <coughs> and was having a conversation a couple weeks ago with a guy who's early 40s, so he's he's not you know been one of, not one of those old old guard, but he's never really used a computer that much. And so I asked him, well, okay, so when you're in your truck and you've got to enter some stuff in there, and he said, no, 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 it's not enter stuff, it's enter stuff. And I said, so can you get email on, on your computer in there? And he just kind of shook his head. He's like, well, I, I think somebody probably could, but I, <laughs> I, 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 I can't, I don't. And I said, well, would you? And he said, no, I'll just wait for my supervisor to tell me if it's important. So that's probably somewhere 25 to 40% of their workforce. So. Yes, you have to be up on the digital piece, but you also have to be very prepared to say, okay, how, how, do we, how are we gonna impact this book, how, this guy? How are we going to help him understand what this new system is all about, these new processes that he's gonna have to follow? Yeah, I think definitely <clears throat> on the flip side, um, just being aware that you know in the workplace, you're gonna work with all different types of generations. Um, on the recruiting side, you know, people come into our office all the time and can't use a computer to apply for the job. Um, and that's that's always hard and just remembering how to communicate with people that, you know, maybe don't have the exact same strengths as you in how they communicate. Uh, and then something a little bit different. So I'm not a recruiter, but the recruiter does sit in our office. And just something to be aware of, I know in my capstone class we kind of talked about this, but um, I know, you know, what you put out on social media, people can see. Um, and I know that, you know, she, sometimes, you know, you can Google somebody, you can look them up on Facebook, like, just being aware of what you put out there is really important, um, just kind of as a good reminder. And that might tie into your second part of your question, which is how it's impacted job search, and I will echo that. Um, anybody who applies for a job um, with our company, one of the first things I do is go out to Facebook and Instagram and things like that to see if I can pull them up. And, um, and that definitely does play into my perception of that potential candidate um, in terms of what I'm seeing just available to me who is definitely not their friend. Um, so I think that I would definitely heed that advice that um, you want to um, ensure that what you're, you're putting out there is something that you really do want anyone and everyone to see if, if they can access it. That just makes me wonder, um, like, as an example, what is something you would see on somebody's social media that you're like, nope, not even going to consider this person? They want to see you. <laughs> <laughs> so like I said, I'm definitely not a recruiter, and I know, you know, I'm not sure, I can't speak to exactly, you know, what our recruiter goes through, but just something she was mentioning to me, I'm going through for the first time hiring somebody myself, um, and she pulls up to see, are there drinking photos? Is that, you know, the profile picture? Is there you know, marijuana, like just kind of being aware of, of the types of photos that are up and what you're doing in those photos. One other thing that I would just say that this isn't tied into social media so much, but um, um, we're somewhat maybe still old school in that we still require a um, resume and a cover letter be submitted to us. And um, increasingly, I see lots and lots of grammatical errors. And, and I think because people are on social media a lot, you know, you see a lot of just um, like, not complete sentences and just phrases and things like that. And um, so much so that, I mean, I used to just kick someone out if I was weeding through, but um, I, 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 I've interviewed a few of these folks where I found issues. I've just put them on the spot. You realize that you had, you know, a couple of grammatical mistakes in your cover letter, because I want to know, you know, on the job, there's mistakes <coughs> that get made too, and that's expected and that's going to happen. And so I've kind of put it back on them in an interview situation just to see you know, what they have to say about that in terms of um, how they handle it. You know, had they, had they rushed through that? Had, was there a process? Do they own, own it? Um, you know, those sorts of things. So, That's um, really good. Yeah. Okay, so I was just going to kind of jump off of her question. You know, with the recent 
my friends and I were talking about the recent election season, right? And so Facebook was a huge place where people voiced their political opinions. Now when we're looking for our jobs, is that something that we you think would better be removed from our page, you know, because it might not be like vulgar, you know, or anything like that, but it definitely is stating your political opinion. Like do you think that, that could hinder you in the hiring process if someone were to see your political opinions? So I definitely, you know, like I said, I'm not the recruiter, but that would not, I would hope that that would not be anything that, that we would take into account, um, you know, nothing discriminatory. Um, like I said, the only times I've seen her um, look at social media was to see if there was, you know, excessive drinking or something illegal, okay. um, nothing, nothing like that. <laughs> I think a good rule of thumb is just trying to, to use your gut in terms of what's professional, um, because certainly you can have, you know, be sharing various opinions and, and have you know expressing differences with someone and I think you know just the, maintaining a if, if you're concerned about it, whether or not something's professional um, or went down a professional road that's something that you can you know manage or clean up before you're applying for a job and, um, especially if it's open to anyone yeah Um, did all of you get your graduate degree, and what do you see the value in getting a graduate degree versus just jumping in and getting experience? I, I stayed um, and got my gradu graduate degree in large part because when I, was, I wasn't ready to be done going to school. I didn't know what I wanted to do, um, and I, I really enjoyed In fact, if somebody would have paid me to just be a professional student, I think I might have continued down that career path. What we call a professor. <laughs> try that, but I was, um, that's true, um, but that was one of the big reasons that, um, and so I applied to the, the graduate program and was accepted, and um, it was, uh, you know, I, I went into the grad program thinking, oh, I did undergrad, I know all these professors, um, this is just going to be a continuation, and I was seriously mistaken about the rigor with which then the graduate program um, required. Um, and so that was a real, I think for a handful of us, it was kind of a gut check. Um, and it was great, but it was definitely um, a, a whole new ball game um, in terms of, of what was required of the grad program. And, and in, invaluable experience that I, I gleaned from that, even though I didn't stay on and, and go on to get my PhD and a handful of in our group did. Um, and as many connections as I made in undergrad, um, our graduate class was one of those unique classes where we are all still very connected. Um, and it's been exciting to see just kind of the cool things that everybody's gone on to do. And like I said, I'm fortunate enough now to have hired um, one of my, my grad school colleagues that does a great job of writing for us. And she even um, schools the accreditation board sometimes on errors she finds on their website. So <laughs> she's helped put AOE on the map, so to speak. I think, I think for me, I, you know, kind of talking about reinventing yourself or not really knowing where to go after graduation, starting out um, in a field that I thought that I was interested in has been huge, and I, and I do like it. I think getting some experience and kind of finding out if this, you know, I have a communication degree, where do I want to take it? Having some, some experience to kind of base that off of, if I ever did decide to go um, to school, then I would have a better focus, I think, of maybe what I wanted to do. Yeah, I, th I think it kind of depends on what, what you want to do and where you want to go. Um, if, if, if you want to go down a, a path that is strictly communication and you enjoy school, then, then go for it. Um, if you aren't sure, then I would say maybe, maybe have, take a couple of jobs and kind of figure some of that out. Uh, for me, I, I, it was about seven or eight years after I graduated that I got into a master's program and I had my employers pay for a good chunk of it. Um, and I was able to apply the things that I was I got it in humanities uh, from uh, CU Denver, sorry. Um, but um, that was a great program because it, it allowed me some flexibility to take what I was learning and apply it to my job. And so my employer got something out of that. It was very relevant for me and um, it, I think it, it moved my career along at, at that point. <coughs> um, but I can see where, um, you know, if I had gotten interested in, in human resources, maybe I would want to have gotten a master's degree in that or business. You know, I, mean, I actually thought about an MBA at one point. Um, you know, and those are things that an employer, some employers will, will pay for or pay, pay for parts of it. So that's another consideration to think about.
Did any of you do internships? So I wasn't lucky enough to get to do an internship. I worked a lot through college, and I really didn't find the time, unfortunately, to do an internship. So I, I, I never did one. I did. Um, that's how I started out in continuing medical education. I was a, a marketing intern for a not-for-profit accredited continuing medical education um, company <coughs> in Golden. Um, and I was doing that part-time and lecturing back here, and teaching some SP200 um, part-time. And that's how I then it transitioned into a full-time <coughs> position and I've stayed in the industry. Ever since. Yeah, I had, I had an internship uh, both semesters of my senior year with the uh, cable company. So the first semester I did marketing um, and then um, did more of a broadcast um, approach my second semester. And so... Um, and I will say my internship was after after my <coughs> master's program, and so um, I know you, a lot of times it happens while you're in school or during a summer break. But um, mine was I just was not finding what I was looking for, and there was this opportunity that seemed like it was at least worth trying out in an industry that I had never heard of before. Um, so I had to <coughs> supplement that with another job. But um, but yeah, it's an internship that I started with. So I. In my conversations with other alumni and professionals, many of them have expressed a desire to have taken like a basic finance class or a video production <coughs> class that wasn't a part of this degree or like it was just one extra class that they didn't have time for. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that you guys found that you wished you could have learned more on that particular skill or something like that? I, I would say it depends on where, where, what sort of career you want. The, the career I have now as a consultant, and I, and I work a lot with a lot of different parts of an organization, the one class that I think I probably would benefit, have benefited from was just a general accounting class. Understand what the heck that finance and accounting organization does. I know it's money in, money out, but in terms of how that, that really works from a technical standpoint, I, I didn't learn that in college, and that's... If I had to go take a class now, that's probably what I would do. Um, that's more of a technical, technical piece, but I think if, if you are wanting to get into a, a, a large company or, or work with large companies, understanding what the different functions do, operations, manufacturing, finance, legal, having just, just a toe in the water to understand what, what it is that they do and kind of how they do that job is really important, especially if you're going to have to write about it or communicate to the people who do that job day in and day out. Um, I certainly think that, you know, the uh, taking a variety of, of classes and just wherever you can, you can get educated is a good thing. I have to say that um, I think that <clears throat> there's no way you're going to come out having every bit of information that you need. Um, and one of the things that I found successful now running my own business and having, I was, I was a biology major, I started out, so I had a ton of science classes, so I got a lot of variety, so maybe this is why I feel this way, but, um, you know, I, I now have to know a lot about finance and accounting and things that, you know, weren't things I was learning day in, day out in my comp studies program, um, but what, what I think I, I am equipped with is knowing who to find, you know, and what questions to ask and that sort of thing, so I, I haven't, I didn't feel like I, I needed a class per se, not to say I wouldn't, I still wouldn't benefit um, from that, but it's, it's I think, uh, two, you can, you can amass information and you know, who to ask and, and finding those experts that can, can impart some information on you. Um, there is one class, though, in my, I was very certain I wanted to do a qualitative thesis, and so I steer clear completely of anything quantitative. Um, which may sound interesting given I was in the sciences, but um, I do a lot with outcomes measurement now and figuring statistical significance of education that our, our partners are developing. And I wish I would have taken Dr. Pendel's uh, methods class, but I had no interest at the time. Um, so I did have that yearning. I think that might have been helpful. Um, but but you're, you're not going to come out knowing everything, and it's, I think, knowing um, where to go and what resources to consult, if it's people or, or books or literature um, or online to, to figure out the information you need. And I, and I guess I'd kind of add on to that. The, maybe the difference for me would be, is it a, is it a technical skill that I'm, that I'm lacking, or is it just a broad concept that might be interesting or uh, helpful in my, my, my career, make me a more well-rounded person? So my example of accounting, 
I could probably take an online <coughs> class and get what I need out of that, or watch a couple of YouTube videos and probably get what I need out of that. Um, whereas there may be some other other classes, uh, literature classes or philosophy classes that might help me think about my career in the workplace and my jobs and my employment um, a little bit differently, and maybe even might set me apart when I get into an interview uh, situation of, do you have this technical skill? No, but I can tell you the philosophy behind it, it you know, and have an interesting conversation with the person. Uh, <coughs> I have time for one more question. <clears throat> Dr. Mark. I'm, I'm going to ask one on everyone's behalf. So y'all have probably heard some version of this question, but I'm sure most of the students in the room are he hearing it a lot now, and that's the, what do you do with that degree, or what are you going to do with that degree? How would you help students answer that question for, if it's an employer asking them, or a relative, just help them answer that. So I recently said that I was up for a promotion and I was against somebody that I'd worked with the last two years. Um, and she, I believe, had a degree in some sort of art design. Uh, and I had my communication studies degree. And I think being able to leverage how important that is for our business. Um, you know, like I said, we have so many different business partners. Uh, I communicate with all of them on a regular basis. I think being able to just really leverage um, you know, being able to use multiple types of communication skills uh, really kind of helped set me apart from, from a group of people that, um, you know, not everybody has those type of skills, so. I think um, in terms of leveraging the degree, so many technical skills can be taught, um, but what, what can't really be taught are, it really is that ability to communicate or you know, if somebody doesn't know how to to um, to construct, um, you know, a, a, a well thought out, um, you know, email or letter, just isn't, you know, the, the writing abilities and things like that. Those are skills that are, are just much more difficult and or time consuming to teach. An employer probably isn't going to take that time. And so those are the skills that you guys all have coming out of this degree that um, I really can set you apart because, like I said, the organization helping people understand one another. That's pretty cool. Uh, you know, you can't put a dollar sign on exactly, you know, as a mechanical engineer, you're going to leave and we, let's see, uh, with two years experience, you're going to make 85000 You can't really do that with a communications degree. Um, you kind of have to chart, chart that course, but that's kind of the cool part about it, I, I think. So don't, I, I, just one more point if we've got time. I remember one of my interviews, I was interviewing with, um, I think it was Pepsi, uh, at the time, they were on campus recruiting, and it was a sales position. And I had the hiring manager across, sitting across, I think there were three of them sitting at a table like this, it was three on one, I was a little intimidated. And one of the first questions was, um, well, you know, looking at your resume here, um, how do you explain that um, you got a 3.0 GPO, uh, 3 GPA in an easy field like communication? And well, I, I know how to respond now. Um, I didn't at the time. And, you know, I think a good response then would have been, you know, well, I don't know that I would have said this. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, from a communication standpoint, I would know not to ask somebody a question like that. Um, I, I wouldn't have gotten the job. I didn't get the job anyway. But um, uh, as a communications person, I could have come up with a more tactful way of asking that question. Um, but not being intimidated or ashamed or, well, it's not a hard science, it's not one of those accounting or finance or business degrees. No, you have something valuable that organizations will pay for. You just have to find the right organization that is ready for your skill set and what you bring to them. So show them who you are, help them understand what value you bring. And you know, part of that is passion, uh, part of that is expertise and just a willingness to learn. Thank you all for being here. Please.